Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever felt icky, sick, or fatigued, or simply wondered if that cell phone by your head is really doing you good, then do we have the Radiation Nation show for you. Today I'll be talking with Daniel T. Debon, an internationally recognized expert in shielding electronic emissions and electromagnetic radiation, EMF protection, and the author of a must-read book for your health and your kids, Radiation Nation. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about the proven health risks of EMF and what you and your family can do about it. That plus we'll talk about glioblastomas, tablets and laptops, smart meters, pill bottles and silicon chips, Newton's inverse square law, specific anthropomorphic mannequins, and what in the world ET phoning home has to do with anything. Gotcha. So welcome to the show, Dan. Are you ready to shine? I sure am, Mike. Thanks an awful lot for inviting me. I really appreciate it. And let's shine together. Woohoo! <laughs> so thank you so much for being on the show here today. Before we dive right into things, and we, we've already been having kind of a lengthy conversation before we got started, how'd you get interested before EMF in electronics? Well, it, it, it's funny. I... Uh, for most of my career, I ran technical laboratories for the Bell System. Mm -hmm. And I was pretty familiar with standards and how do you test technology to substantiate claims by manufacturers. And so um, six years ago or so, um, my, my boys were, were visiting. They had their laptops on their lap for hours at a time. Mm -hmm. My wife says, I want grandchildren. That can't be good for you to have that on your lap for so long. And I thought about it a little bit and I thought, wait a minute, I actually do understand what potentially is there that could maybe, could be harmful. Well, I did a little bit of uh, research, study work on finding, was there any evidence that there could be uh, potential dangers? And was there anything I could do about it to try to, fix the problem that potentially could be there. Sure enough, uh, what, 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 there, was, there was clear evidence in the scientific community that stated very close proximity to electronics, uh, that, particularly those who emit uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, like EMF uh, can and will damage the cells and maybe have long-term impacts. In, in fact, after, I think, three hours or four hours or so, 25% of the male sperm is immobile. 2% of the female is impacted by tumor, believe it or not, with, with exposures of that mic. So we, we, I said, well, maybe I should try to find something to help my, my sons. So I went and I, I was familiar with uh, uh, technologies that could shield various um, frequencies um, that were being admitted by the, the, the laptop. So I, I built them some because I couldn't find them on the market. So they began using them and their friends wanted to use some. And so I built some for them. And, and all of a sudden we ended up ha writing a book, having a company, becoming the expert in electromagnetic radiation and the exposures and the impacts to the body. That's how I got started. Self-preservation. Yeah, self-preservation. I wanted grandchildren. It, it, it's reminding me, when I was on Maui, and I mentioned to you I, I had a, 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 a very severe accident with left me. I've now got twin titanium femurs and hips. And a, a, after that second accident, putting a laptop on my lap because I didn't have enough. I, I had five quarts of other people's blood, and I needed more <laughs> to keep going. So I was stuck on the couch. I could barely raise my head. And so we tried plunking a laptop down on my legs. And, and my rods felt like they were heating up, like I was being cooked from the inside. And I did research. I think it was a book from the 80s. Maybe this will ring a bell to you. I think it was mid-80s. might have been called The Body Electric. Uh -huh. and, and it was this wealth of information about how we can use electricity and electric fields to, to stimulate growth, for, for obviously for regenerating bone, uh, for how a chameleon regrows its tail, right. and, and how electricity can cause cells to be stimulated and grow out of control even. Well, 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 well Mike, a, a RF signal, a radio frequency signal, that the Wi-Fi coming out of the laptop is 
about two dot from one dot nine gigahertz to five gigahertz, roughly, depending on the kind. It's like in this space. A microwave oven, when you take a piece of meat and you put it inside a microwave oven, mm -hmm. it's 2.3 gigahertz. It's the same range. What happens to your meat? Oh. It actually heats up the water between the cells. It oscillates the cells. And all of a sudden, you're cooked. So th there's no surprise. You have basically lightning rods for capturing microwave signals coming out of your laptop. They're not very strong. They're not as strong as a, a, a microwave oven, but they're certainly there and can be damaging. And in, in fact, um, they're thermally increasing the temperature of all the surrounding skin by two, two degrees. In your case, it's not just one inch penetration. It's, it's that, uh, that two inch, three inch penetration. So I'm not surprised that you felt that. And that probably explains this kind of jumps ahead of the story, but there was at least a year long period where I was neurotic about oh, yeah. no cell phones. I would go into a meditation center that I would go to for, for, for healing. In fact, I, I held space there for six months, I'm sitting there two, three, four hours a day. Just one person would show up yeah. with a cell phone in there and I'd get nauseous. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you why. Um, uh, there, there are two forms of uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation. Mm -hmm. There's the stuff that's really low, and 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 it's a byproduct of the of a current flow in, in the products that we buy. So that that's 300 hertz and below. It, so there's some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. That stuff doesn't ground. So you're not a grounding source to it. Okay. But an RF signal, a radio frequency signal, looks for ground. You are a grounding rod for that. So even though you were four foot away, six foot away, that signal was looking for you because it was a source to ground. So I'm not surprised that you actually would feel even the very, very littlest of uh, minute uh, emissions from uh, those electronics because you had additional kinds of components to your body that were making it worse for you. Um, as opposed to the average person. Now, the good news is I've gotten at least somewhat better. I think as I topped off my fluids, got all the blood literally back in my veins, I felt better. I still, I, I'm one who, and I talk a lot on the show, I don't own a smartphone, although there is yeah. a desire to get a camera phone now, but keep everything shut off because I'd like yeah. to carry a camera with me. That sounds cool to always have one handy. Right. But I know that the minute this show is done, for instance, I will close. Uh, I will click closed on things here. A web browser will pop up to get my files to the editor. And it says, get off the computer and go outside. <laughs> and I will get myself electronics free as fast as I physically yeah. can. And yeah. I start to feel better. So is this something, while I am particularly sensitive, I'm on one end of the spectrum, although there are people, maybe we'll talk about my wife later, who are even further on the spectrum. Are we all? first off, swimming in EMF and, and um, affected by EMF. So let's talk a little bit about how we got here. Please. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, sort of the environment we find ourselves in. And I'll give you an example. When I was in Bell Labs and, and I was connected to a mainframe, mm -hmm. it was... 500 feet away, I had very little electronics in front of me. It connected to that mainframe. That mainframe emitted all sorts of emissions to me, but it never bothered me. Why? Well, it was 500 feet away. Today, when I have my cell phone, when I have my laptop, I have my tablet, I have almost the same power as that mainframe, and it's sitting in my lap, it's sitting in my pocket, it's sitting close to me. So that is fundamentally different. And it's only really occurred over the last 10 years or so, right? Think about it. We, 20 years ago, I had a cell phone to call my friend. My friend didn't have a cell phone. We never really used it. Today, your child at 12 years old is hours at a time talking to her friends on her cell phone. 
So all of a sudden, our environment has changed so rapidly with a, a, a technology, a toxin in our environment that didn't exist almost 10 years ago. So what is the net result of that? To answer your other question, it was maybe five years ago, um, science had uh, believed based on some analysis work that had been done that 10 to 15 percent of us that were exposed to electronics like that were what they call uh, electromagnetic hypersensitivity. Today, science says it's more than 20%. Some in the clinical environment talk about it as almost 25%. Almost 25% of us are walking around because of this exposure to something that's not man-made. I often point out a cow in a field doesn't generate uh, emissions. It's the stuff we built in our environment that's actually polluting our environment. It is literally considered a toxin. It's funny. The image I was going for for the background image before I went with the Swiss Alps was a cow in a field. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been perfect, Mike. <laughs> but we did get a Swiss Alps image. It was it was a there cow in go. cow in the Alps. So all right. So let's 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 back up for a bit here, and let's talk about a little bit about what this radiation is. I really want to get to what we can do about it. And um, we talk about 25%. One of the things, as soon as you say that, the, the two-letter word comes to mind, which is a little disconcerting, 5G. Oh, okay. When, when, when you talk about digital technology up to recently, it's up to 4G. Um, when, when your wife asks you to fill up the kiddie pool and you have a hose, and you put it into the uh, pool and you turn it on, your wife gets mad at you because it's taking too long. So you decide to get another one. You put two in and all of a sudden it fills up. Today, up to today, up to G4, we have a carrier frequency connected to the cell tower and a digital signal. A digital signal is on, off, on, off, on, off. So it is hitting your body's cells and it's hitting the cells on, off, on, off. If you had a static load of 10,000 pounds and you put it on a piece of concrete, it wouldn't work, break. If you lift it up and put it down, you lift it up and put it down, it breaks the concrete. Well, that's what's happening to the cells. The cells are in oxidative stress. They're saying, hey, I don't like this load. Let me pause this, you for a second. In, in, in other words, it's a jackhammer. It's going da 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 It's a jackhammer. Now I'm going to go back to the story about the, the pool. Mm -hmm. Your wife said, I wanted two of them. Well, guess what? With G5, it's mul MIMO, multiple in, multiple out. Multiple data sources in, multiple data sources out. So now you have two jackhammers hitting the cell. And because they can't go very far, they're on every block. So all of a sudden, your whole environment is now swamped with uh, technology frequencies that are 30 times higher, potentially, than the current cell phone technologies. Believe it or not, we know very little about it in terms of its impact to the body. We, we haven't had a chance to look at it. When, when the FCC was reviewing there was so many of us who went in front of the FCC saying, we, we don't know enough about what's the impact to our families and friends. And you are, without any concern, introducing it to our environment. So we know from the data we have today, if you project out, it's worse. How worse? We don't know. It's what? not a good thing. What is the data suggesting today? Because the, the common argument will be nothing has happened yet. And yet there's this whole 15, 20 year window that we're playing with. Yeah. M Michael, here's a story. Uh, trans fats. Yes. 35, 40 years ago, trans fats, there was this lonely bio 
chemist who said, it's the trans fats that's being introduced into our bodies that's giving us the cholesterol buildup. It's giving us, you're frying our foods in that. And he said, that's what it is. It's not necessarily the cholesterol in our eggs that's going to kill us. It took 35 to 40 years before it was banned out of our environment. Why? Because there became a preponderance of evidence that said that technology is not good for it. And it was, as you know, it was banned last year. Well, that's where we are with this technology. It's really only been in our lives for the last 10 years or so in real concentration. And science knows a lot about its impact, but it's not sufficient to convince or sway governments to minimize the exposures to keep us more protected. Now, some countries, I, I want to know what some of the science is behind this. And I know that some countries, they at least have stricter standards oh, on yeah. this, and, yeah. and particularly Europe and Australia, and particularly when it comes to kids as well. Oh, yeah. Well, you can't have in, in certain parts of France, um, there, there is no Wi-Fi um, because of the known dangers and the commitment to minimize exposures to children. Children, by the way, are far more susceptible than we are. When, this, when the standard for the cell phone was created uh, for 35 years ago, it was created to minimize the thermal impact to a six-foot male thermal impact, not the biological impact. So when you use a cell phone, you're six foot male, the signal penetrates the head by one inch and it can heat up by two degrees and be within standards. Fast forward to today, your child is five years old, that same signal is going completely through the head. And because the standard didn't worry about the biological impacts, the long-term impacts Will only be seen years from now. That's pretty dangerous. Thank you. You mentioned biological and thermal, and and yeah. so biological is kind of where we got the SAR, uh, the, the the SAR, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Right. But there really is nothing on biological. What are what is biological? Is that the metabolizing of glucose? Is that is that cells going out of control? What what is that? I'll make it simple. Frontal lobe cancer of the brain has increased 2% compounded for the last 10 years. That's a biological impact. That's been correlated to the growth of cell phones. And, and so there are the gray, the, 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 the cell can mutate mm -hmm. or there can be DNA damage. It takes years for that to exhibit itself in the form of a danger to the body. It can take years. Cancers can take many, many years. Tumors take a long time to create. So that that's where we really are. We're in the space where we're getting guinea pigs for the technologies around us. How do we know? And, and I don't I don't even like the term devil's advocate, but what are the studies showing that correlate this? Because it sounds in many ways like the early days of the cigarette industry, where there's 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 kind of a, no, that's not really taking place. Here, let's sponsor, let's give uh, doctors, let them talk about what their favorite cigarette is as an advertisement. You know, it's funny, you, you remind, M Michael, you, you remind me of a, of a story back in the late 70s when I was around, by the way. Um, the, the chairman of Philip Morris was in front of a pediatrician's um, group, and he was asked by the group in the UK, if you smoke a cigarette and you're pregnant, is that a problem? And he said, absolutely not. Except the child may be born smaller. And what woman wouldn't want a small baby? <laughs> it was like, you gotta be kidding. That was the mentality at that time. And there's a little bit of that going on now, but there is clear and very crisp evidence that is worldwide about the dangers of these emissions. We know, for, for example, Dr. Ali Johansson, he recently did a study and published uh, about oxidative stress to the cell. Um, and he was the one who actually, believe it or not, also picked up something I think you may relate to. And that is that it's not just oxidative stress to the cell. It, it is also 
a suppression of the immune system. So like you don't get any better. It, it doesn't improve because your own system can adopt under those exposures. What does oxidative stress mean? What happens when, what do we know from science about what happens to the cell? Well, this is what we know. When, when there is a pulsing signal on, a, on the membrane of a cell, mm -hmm. the cell membrane weakens, calcium can penetrate the cell, mm -hmm. build up, oxide then forms, and that's what causes the DNA damage or the mutated cell. So there are really, we understand the mechanics. We know that everyone doesn't get exposed, has those problems, but we do know that if it's continued oxidative stress, there are more serious concerns you should be worried about, and science knows this. By the way, the reason why, you know, why is, why are we questioning science? And you should be, by the way, but why are you questioning it? Well, let me talk about statistics. If, if we had a, a population of 10,000 people and we watched them for 10 years and you asked me, would that affect that person in that environment? I could tell you with 95% confidence that the data I have 10 years from now will tell you if it is true or not. In other words, I actually talk about it in terms of kids. Take 10,000 kids, lock them in a room, see what happens, see who dies. That's the only thing statistics can show us. That's why we don't have this comprehensive, well understood, statistically significant data is because we never are gonna be able to test those large populations. Well, you can go by you can go by the statistics once we have the statistics, but the yes. technology is racing ahead of the statistics. You bet. And and Michael, the the um, if you look at the metadata, in other yes. words, if if you look at the one set of data and compare it to another set of data, independent studies have been done where that metadata was looked at and reaffirmed that there is clear. Evidence. In fact, the Bio Initiative annually releases a study of a comprehensive view of what's going on in the world. They do an excellent job. Dr. Carpenter, Cindy Sage, they're people who are in the uh, business that's trying to help the public understand these problems. And, and that's they're they're working with the WHO. Is that correct? Yeah, they they are, and um, um, they're worldwide though. They, they they're not just in the U.S. Uh, they're a, a group of uh, scientists from all around the world that are trying to capture and make public information that helps people understand the problem. So there's no doubt we have evidence, whether it's sufficiently statistically significant or not. Uh, you may want to wait around for it before you take precautions, but, but I'd suggest you take precautions before we know <laughs> statistically significantly. <laughs> and, and and I was given the doctor's note that I have to take precautions. <laughs> right. Yeah. In your case, you have to. You have very little choice. Yeah. yeah. So so we we're talking a little bit here of effects of EMF on our chromosomes, on on our cells. What about specifically on brain function? Yeah. Actually, um, I, I I spoke about the two percent increase in frontal lobe cancers. By the way, the, the frontal lobe cancers are because that part of the brain is the most softest of tissue. So what we know from our study work is that that's likely where you're going to see a problem if it exists. And uh, true to form, the data does support that as being the problem. We actually now think it may be also when your brain begins breaking down, blood barrier uh, breakdown. And that is, we think, is correlated to RF exposure. And um, we, we've found um, evidence, um, I'm not sure statistically significant is accurate, but we do have lots of data that's talking about how we correlate uh, uh, blood-brain barrier breakdowns as of impact, which um, uh, suppresses the, the 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 frontal not only the frontal lobe but the whole brain uh, re response to the exposure.
So um, we know that. Here's another thing, something more practical to know. When, when you when you have a cell phone and you put it next to your bed on, on, on the table, right next to your bed, and you're having a problem sleeping, what's going on? The signal is interfering with the melatonin, the creation of, of melatonin within your head. It disrupts the function. So you can't sleep because you don't have melatonin. So believe it or not, it's not just the cell that's impacted. It's not just the cell that I don't like talking about oxidative stress because it doesn't really talk about the true full impact. We know functions begin breaking down, like the immobile sperm. That's not a cell. That's a, that's a co- collection of multiple cells that becomes immobile. So, And that's uh, mitochondria, glucose. What's- yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it is. Right, exactly. So we, we know. That, so when you sleep, don't have any of this stuff around you because it does impact your bodies. So let's let's talk about some of the other health risks and then and then we'll we'll get into kids. What would you okay. say are some of the top EMF health risks out there? Uh, well, you know, there's been an increase in ADHD. There's been an increase in leukemia. There's been an increase, actually, in, in quite a number of the diseases that are uh, been plaguing us over the last 10, 15 years. So we have evidence through study work that we know those impacts occur. Um, And we know that through trending that it's increasing the problem over time. Um, I'm I'm thinking something we we need to clarify too. There's actually two forms of emissions you should be worried about. The ones on your head, that are touching your body, they're the worst that you can have because there's no distance between you uh, and the electronics. So there's no real barrier. So that's close to the body exposure. Then we have the ambient. In a classroom, when there's an RF signal in a room, the ambient becomes the concern. Um, ten year, when you went to When you went to school, there were no emissions in any room that would impact your body uh, and maybe influence ADHD or um, any of the other child uh, concerns. An RF signal in a current room where there there are uh, transmitters or Wi-Fi transmitters, you actually have the strength, half, slightly less than half the power level of a cell phone to your head. So think about this. It's not just a signal that's touching the child that's fairly strong. It's all day. So the duration of that signal uh, and the exposure at that magnitude is what's dangering um, our environment. For me personally, to be in that environment, just as if I went into a meditation room and everybody had their cell phone, I, I would be First, I'd probably feel a little bit nauseous and queasy. It'd feel like a low blood sugar issue. Then right. I'd lose the ability to concentrate. And yeah. then, and then, honestly, if, and particularly if I didn't know what's going on, I'd be a pissed off mofo. And you'd have behavior challenges on your hands. Oh, yeah. Well, well you, you know, to, to uh, go back to one of your questions, um, you, your eyes can get blurry. You can get headaches. You, you, you can get fogginess in your brain, all of these are contributed to uh, exposures like that. And in your case, which I would, without really fully understanding it, would characterize you roughly as electrohypersensitive, um, it's worse for you because this is what your cells are doing. It's saying, I'm tired of this exposure. I'm not going to work like I used to. I'm not going to talk to my neighbor's cell and pass the protein. So it becomes dysfunctional. And that's what you're beginning to feel. The the body's breaking down. In your case, it's not, this is not the first time it's done it. It's done it a lot. And as it, as you go over time, it actually becomes worse. You, You tolerate less because the body's saying, that's it. I don't want to deal with that anymore. 
and kids, they're getting hit with it so much. And maybe we should go into kids. Actually, before we go into kids, Jessica, I mentioned off here earlier that, that uh, she had uh, mold toxicity syndrome, and she's getting better from that. And she's sensitive to a lot of things. In the future, we're wanting kids. Once we've got her 100%, what do we need to know about EMF and female re reproductivity? I can't even say that. Reproductivity. Oh, I, I'm not a proponent of this, but there are some in the science community that talk about exposures of the womb of a 12 year old. They talk about the exposure damaging the DNA of the egg. They talk about how that can be transferred into subtending generations. So in some people, some experts believe it's a very, very serious thing. We're only going to find out the impact years from now when, when they have children. So we know that's for sure. In fact, um, last in, uh, last quarter of uh, the end of quarter of last year, there was a study released uh, about uh, pregnant women. Uh, exposed to, to uh, electromagnetic radiation. They all were given meters in San Francisco. And they said, monitor everywhere you go in your first, they just were pregnant. They found that you were three times more likely than the general public to miscarriage because of the exposures. So it's it's not like, where, where there, there's a debate. We, Cindy Sage, 30 years ago, identified that. And, and now all of a sudden, a, a, a physician out of uh, San Francisco found out about it. So we know that, that the it does have biological impacts, and it's not just on the cell, but it's also on functions of the cell. So and I'll mention a few more of the different things that it can affect, and then let's jump into kids. Asthma, autism. Uh, genetic damage, cancer, brain cancer, breast cancer, leukemia, uh, female reproductive health, um, pregnancy, sperm defects, testes right. deformation, insomnia, which you mentioned, pineal gland, liver damage, tinnitus, the ringing in the ears, toasted skin syndrome. Hadn't heard of that one. Oh, toasted skin syndrome. That's really, you know, you take your laptop and you put it on your lap. Mm -hmm. And three hours later, you take it off and it's all red. Toasted skin syndrome. That's toasted skin syndrome. And it can last if it's too much, if you do it too much. Wow. So let's let's go into kids and then let's talk about what we can do. Cause because I, I'm into empowering people, not not the scaring. Yeah. We've had some scare because we're all carrying this around and we're swimming in the soup, but there are things we can do. But first off, why do children absorb more microwave radiation than adults? It, it's very simple. Um, the outer skin going into the body acts as a barrier. So um, when a signal hits your cranium, it's thick. It stops. It doesn't go much farther than the cranium because there's substance that's shielding, that's damming up that, that signal. A child doesn't have that. They're, um, they're, they have very immature uh, muscle growth. Um, they have very immature uh, uh, body mass. And as a result of that, they, um, they have um, greater uh, exposure. And, and as I said before, the standard cell phone designed for a six-foot male can only penetrate one inch. For a child, it goes completely through their head. And you got to remember, unlike me, who didn't have that exposure for many years, maybe the last 10, 20, 30 years of my life, theirs is just starting. So all of a sudden, this penetration of the, the known thermally emitting signal, which is a microwave, and then adding to it the known fact that it can do damage DNA, it can damage the cell, but with DNA damage or mutate the cell, that becomes an unknown. We we really don't know what what it means twenty years from now. 
So it, it means for kids to be even more careful. Yeah. You, you bet. In, in fact, you, you mentioned a, a minute ago, um, you know, what can we do about these things? We've got to worry. Believe it or not, if you know your surroundings and you think about the environment you live in, you can actually reduce those exposures. I talk about that as bees in the room. Every tablet you have, every laptop you have, every cell phone you have, they're a bee. One bee in a room won't kill you. A thousand bees will. So all you got to think about is how do I minimize the number of bees in that room? That th By reducing those numbers, mm -hmm. you reduce the probability of impacting your body. So uh, go ahead. No, go ahead, please. When we talk about bees, then we, we, we should talk about all of the bees. So we're not, we're not just talking cell phones. We're talking microwave ovens, fridge, stoves, TVs, hair exactly. dryers, and, and, and even or especially the, the old school, although they used to be considered powerful, um, wireless phone. Yes. All of those are bees in the room. And, um, and, and you really have to be aware of what they, where they are. Normal person close to a, um, a refrigerator, mm -hmm. that's the extremely low frequency emissions that we were talking about before. If you're four foot, five foot away, you're, you're probably okay. If you have a chair and you're sitting eight hours a day next to a half horsepower motor that's operating and you're a foot away reading your book, that's not a good thing. You got to know that's the source. Um, anything that draws current, a, a light bulb um, turned on, has an emission in the wall. Maybe not at the light bulb itself, depending on if it's condescent or incandescent. But um, all you got to know is that's where it is. You got to be careful. Turn it off if you don't. With a cell phone, and you won't understand this, Michael, because you don't use these things, but if you have a cell phone that has a Wi-Fi, a Bluetooth, and a cell connection, you have to ask yourself, why do I need those three Bs? All you need is the cell tower B. The other ones turn off. What about the B? That brings up a great question. What about the B that I see so many people wear that's attached to their ear now permanently? Yeah. Um, that's typically a Bluetooth technology. That that goes about 30 feet. Um, science doesn't differentiate. It's an RF signal. Science doesn't differentiate the difference between the dot six volts per meter versus 1.6 volts per meter from a cell phone. It doesn't differentiate it. So it basically says there may be the same impact. I make the assumption, it's a conservative assumption, that you gotta be crazy to have an earbud, wireless earbud to your ear eight hours a day because it's an RF signal. And in fact, it's funny, I had a, um, a, a, a yoga teacher uh, that came to me one day. She showed me her little new watch that was monitoring her, her body function. And she asked me, isn't this a nice idea? I said, what are you, nuts? That is a Bluetooth signal that's communicating to your, um, your cell phone. And if it's not controlled, there can be a constant signal that's interfering with your body. And you don't even realize it. What if you take that watch and shut off the Bluetooth? Yeah, then you're fine. You believe it or not, simple as that. What about the Garmin's in our car, GPS? I don't want to pick on Garmin, and, and uh, I, I love some of their stuff, but what about GPS in our cars? Yeah, let's stay on the uh, Bluetooth theme. Okay. That, that connects to the, uh, to the systems within the car. If you have that cell phone and it's in your pocket, don't do that because it's constantly transmitting and communicating with your equipment inside your car. If you take that same phone and you put it on the other chair on the seat, you still have the wireless connection, but the signal is much farther away from you. So you're more safe. And in, in fact, 
this is a good, a good rule of thumb, uh, Michael. Um, the worst danger of a of a, a bee in the room or a, a, a technology to, is when it's closest to your body. Mm -hmm. it, 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 but when you're one foot away, almost 80% of that danger is gone. By four foot, almost 98. It's logarithmically dropping off. It's becoming much, 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 much less. So by simply taking stuff, devices, and moving them away from you, you're actually helping yourself prevent using preventative techniques to reduce the exposures in your life. Well, that gets it at the top three things we can do. One, distance, Newton's, Newton's what yeah. is it, inverse law of the square. You've right. got exposure, how little time are we, and then shielding, which, which I want to get to just before yeah. the end. Right, exactly. It's very simple. You know, actually, I often point out, you know, I, I build shielding technologies. Why? Because I think everyone's going to be using their cell phones, whether they should or shouldn't, because it's a modern device that's pretty convenient for so many. Um, but you don't need a shield if you're aware of time and duration, um, time, duration, and distance. If you keep it away from you, then there's very little problem. If you keep it close to you, only do it a little bit and you're fine. If, if you pick up your cell phone and, and talk to your mother and, 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 and you talk to her for three minutes and hang up, I, I wouldn't worry about that in terms of a long-term um, biological impact. If, if you sit there and, and you use it for hours at a time, that's when it becomes serious. So you gotta think about those things when you're using these technologies around you. So what do we do? Let's say we're stuck at work and the technologies are on, they're all around us and we can't get away from them. Are things that we can do to, oh, bad pun, I apologize, meter our exposure? Actually, um, that's one of those things where we, I'm a proponent of controlling your environment because you can. So you want to think about that. When, under the conditions of public domain where the, you don't control it, you've got to be aware of what's around you and try to minimize it as best you can. You really can't shield yourself because you'd have to have a, a shield all around you to protect your body, and that's unlikely. Um, but you can move away from those sources that may be impacting your body. That's one thing I don't like to talk about because there's not much we can do about it. You just have to be aware of it and make sure you, you, you take care of yourself. So let's talk about what we can do. So we've got, we've got getting, getting um, <laughs> quieting the bees that are around us, shooing us, shooing as many of them in this, away as we can, and yeah. partying with the bees for as little time as we can. Now let's talk about making bee shields. What does okay. that mean? What is shielding these days? When, when, you, um, when you have a device next to your body, uh, what, 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 what can be done is you can prevent uh, RF signal is omnidirectional. But th what that means is, it, think of it as there's a little ball at the end of your finger, mm -hmm. and it's opening up, opening up, opening up. Yep. So it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It's omnidirectional, going all directions. Um, and so what you try to do is make sure it doesn't come in your direction. If it still goes to the cell tower, you still can communicate. But if you can prevent it from going towards your body, that's what you want to do. And that's basically what shielding does. Shielding, you want to make sure is able to shield the, the up to 10 gigahertz, roughly. Uh, that, that's the uh, up to modern technology, say, for, for Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and cell phones. So you want to make sure that when it transmits, it's not transmitting in your direction. That's what actually shielding does. Uh, we, we actually use a variety of different technologies. Um, we, 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 when you look at a fish in the water and you think it's there, but it's really there, that's called refraction. And we refract the extremely low frequency stuff. We absorb the RF stuff. And then we conduct whatever's left to ensure that nothing's gone pass through. 
And, and that's what you want to try to do. Try to find a way of shielding all of the potential signals from uh, the technology and then uh, prevent it from going in your direction. So we can shield, what does it look like to shield a phone? What, what would that look like? Well, you know what a phone looks like? You, you, if you take a, a, a modern phone, um, a smartphone, and think of a flap that goes in front of it, yep. and then put it next to your head where the flap's in between the device and your body, that's the shield. It's a simple concept, it's not complex. The technology is complex, but the, 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 the problem solving that it provides is, sim is a simple device. So on, on that note, and putting it to her ear, it br brings up two tangential thoughts that, that seem fun and important, if fun is the right word. First off, if you're someplace where you're not getting a strong signal, you could actually be emitting your, or, or, and thinking, well, I'm safer here. There's not as much of a signal. It can right. be piping you twice as much. Yeah. Let me explain that uh, to, 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 to expand on your thought. Um, cell phones actually modulate. They have a, like a, a low, medium, and high. You don't want it high because that's when the signal is the strongest. You always want it the lowest. To your point, if you're not getting a signal, the cell phone's modulating high because it's trying to get to a cell tower. So when you have difficulty touching a cell tower, making a call, that's the worst it can be. Um, when you're a block away from the cell tower, it's always the lowest. So um, if you're having difficulty, you gotta watch your time. You wanna make sure you limit it as much as you can, particularly if you're far away from the, the transmitting source. Thank you. And I'm, I'm wearing tin cans on my ears. Some, some you know, they, they um, help me. It's like a studio in a headset. And, and it helps me for the purposes of the interview but um, it, it doesn't feel good. And I finally found a way to get good sound quality getting off of this and getting onto a, a lapel setup, which is coming tomorrow. And it's just good. interesting synchronicity of the universe I'm getting off because they don't feel good. But right. there's, there's something that I tried a long time ago in the past. I'm wondering if the technology has come a long ways. Um, I'm going to, for lack of a better term, call it air tubes. Yeah. Air tubes were terrible for the last five, 10 years. It's acoustical connection between uh, basically a speaker and the bottom of the device and a tube that brings that audio to a speaker vibrating in the ear. Um, and they were terrible. Uh, we actually um, worked and designed a new device, which is acoustical in nature, but improve that technology where we believe that not only are you safe, but you can listen to your music and enjoy it because the high fidelity uh, performance that they have. And that's, and the reason I bring that up is because if I understand this correctly, um, if you wear, if you think I'm good because I'm wearing a, um, a plug-in, I'm not going Bluetooth and this sounds neurotic, but, but, but you can, a lot of people can feel this, and I'm, I'm betting even if you can't feel it, doesn't mean it's not having an effect. It just means you're not hypersensitive. But plugging into a cell phone and having your earbuds on, if it's not shielded well, right. you're actually transmitting the signal right up to your brain as well. The, the, absolutely. Here's some rules of thumb. Uh, the worst thing you can do is take a cell phone and put it directly to your head. That's the worst. What's slightly better is if you have earbuds that are wired to a cell phone. The best is put it in your hand and go use um, communications where this is at least one foot away from you and you're protected. So you're right. The, the signal is, is extreme low frequency is going up and will influence the cells it touches, and it is close. So it's not, you're not perfectly safe. You are, are being exposed to something that could affect your body. If we need to purchase a cell phone, and, and almost everybody sooner or later is in this market, and again and again and again, 
Is the SAR rating the best that we can go by? What are the challenges with it? And, and how do we choose the safest? Uh, obviously, habits is the, changing our habits is the most important thing. Yeah, SAR, specific absorption rate. Mm -hmm. What it means is, what's the strength of something coming out? And the maximum strength it can produce by FCC standard is 1.6 watts per, uh, per, per, per kilogram. So it can, it can produce up to 1.6. By, by the way, it also can drift by 10 to 15 percent and still be standard it goes to 1.9 volts per kilogram um so the lower the sar the lower the strength but i need to warn you that science doesn't differentiate between 1.1 watts per kilogram and 1.6 watts per kilogram um we would argue that it has the same effect unless otherwise proven um we don't have enough scientific data to be that granular so I wouldn't think that you, you you have this high level of confidence and more safety if it's lower. But you may want to do it to have some action you can take. But ultimately, I don't think it means that much for your safety. What else can we do for our kids who they, they have to use these devices for school? They're, they're left, right, and center around our kids. What habits can we change or what? Devices do we need to be aware of that we may not realize are um, affecting our kids or potentially affecting our kids? Yeah, I, actually, that's a wonderful question. Uh, all the technologies we're talking about um, can can be controlled. So, um, if I, I mentioned before, if, you, if you're not using Bluetooth or Wi-Fi on your cell phone, turn them off. You don't need them. Um, if you um, Put it, your phone, cell phone in airplane mode. You still get a phone call, but you, um, but, but you can't transmit out. Just by taking time to turn off that B, that transmitter, is a good thing. So when kids are, are in school and they have their laptops on and they're not con communicating to uh, using Wi-Fi, they don't need the Wi-Fi on. In fact, we're working on a technology where we actually turn off the Wi-Fi when the application's not up. You don't need it up. Um, and most of the time, you may be fine without it. So in your diligence, you should be looking at ways of turning off those bees as a practice of general precautionary practice. You know, one of the bees that we had forgotten about that we used to do on Maui, and, and like I told you, we were, we were crazy on Maui because I was feeling so ill from this. Right. Is is we would unplug our router at oh. night, and and that as of today, as of reading your book, that's she's sleeping every evening, and until we move to a place that we're Wi-Fi free every evening. Right. Actually, M Michael, um, for ten dollars, you can get a little light control. You plug it into the wall. You you put the timer on, and you say turn it off at ten o'clock at night. Perfect. And turn it back on at seven o'clock in the morning. Yeah, when you're sleeping, you don't need it. Simple things like that can actually help improve your life, as you mentioned. Um, and it's not stuff that costs a lot of money. It's not difficult to do. And taking those slight precautions does ultimately help you help help to helps your health. Woohoo! <laughs> right, exactly. If you could give people, I, I want to take my coaching hat and take it from me and give it to you right now. If you could give people one homework assignment to help them a little bit, to help, to help them, I don't know if it's awareness or taking a step back, something to do with this topic to help people today. What one homework assignment would you give people? I'll, I'll probably answer it slightly differently Go for to it. your question. Um, you can't hope that someone else is going to make sure you're safe. You have the action to protect yourself. You have the responsibility to you and your family to make sure that your environment is the best it can be. And so your action is to make sure that you take all the precautionary measures that your family needs to be safe. It's as simple as that. 
and don't wait for someone else to do it. When they did the FCC standard on 5G, just to go back to a discussion we had, there was no review of the impact of 5G. And we know for sure it's potentially significant. So if you think the FCC is going to be worried about your family, you're wrong. You have that obligation. And 5G rolls out in 2018, so it means that we we have double the 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 onus is on us, double fold so to speak, to get the bees down, because yeah. more bees are coming our way. Oh yeah, no question about it. And and those bees, they came from Mexico. They they they're, they're gonna they're <laughs> gonna you know these are the killer bees. You know you got to be worried about that. Uh, and you're right. In 5G, you're going to have every block is going to have a transmitter. What they're going to be doing with that technology is eliminating the cable to your home. That's the biggest motivator to 5G is it can handle very high speed broadband. And it can handle it so fast, it can handle uh, multiple sources within the home and be the carrier of choice. You will not need Wi Fi. You will not need cable. 5G will be able to replace that. And so, when that begins happening, all of a sudden it's more dense, um, and so there's more danger. So you really want to be aware of that. Does does I, I I was reading in your book about smart meters and the and the challenge of smart meters, and you talked about shielding on the wall. This is this is the electric meters that that re, uh, that send data to the electric company so that we don't have anybody coming out reading a meter. You talked about electric shielding on the wall, and you said it's weak, but it's better than no effect. EMF paint. I'd never heard of this one before. Oh, yeah. Actually, it, they put aluminum inside. It becomes a conductor. Um, there, there are, if you have a, a meter that is on your garage and there's a garage space, a couple spaces between you and the meter and you're inside the house and your bedrooms are two uh, rooms in, you don't have to worry about anything. The distance is keeping you safe. So you don't worry about that. However, if you're in an apartment, a meter is right next to the head of your bed and you're sleeping at night with that transmitter. That is a cell phone transmitter. That I would move the bed as far away as I could from that meter if you don't want to shield it because those are a constant digital, market, uh, digital load. There was a device I had um, I was admittedly nuts when I was feeling really ill with this. There was a device I had, and I can't remember. I think it was all I can remember. It was called, I think it was a multimeter. And, yes. and I used to walk around the house and I walked around my dad's office was the most amazing old, old school Gloucester, Massachusetts had this radiator with this piping, probably copper piping that went out to the roads. And that actually had the biggest signal in the whole place was by that old copper conductor. radiator. Yeah, it was a conductor. It, drew, it draw, draws the signal. When, when you used to want to watch TV with the rabbit ears and they didn't quite work, you'd put a piece of aluminum on top of it. That's an RF signal, and it would easily come to the down. The, so what, RF signals look for ground, and that's what was going on there. Yeah, But those meters, they're notoriously inaccurate. Well, they, okay, I won't be recommending them to people right, if we got rid of ours. Practice. I was like, that's too the much info for me. <laughs> but, but they may be a good indicator for you. So, so um, any last advice you want to give to parents for their kids? Yeah, um, I'll tell it by a story. There was a 16-year-old um, daughter that was harassing their parents for a phone. She wanted to have a cell phone. And they finally broke down and bought it for her. A year later, she died of cancer of the brain. And at that time, they believed that it was because their daughter used the phone so much and exposed her so many times is why she passed away. That article was written the year I actually designed the Defender Shield. All I could kept on thinking is you got to be careful about this technology. So 
you got to tell your kids, yeah, here is the stuff, but be careful. Make sure you, you're cautious on that technology and take precautionary measures when using it. Do not put it in your back pocket because it can impact the womb. Do not put, put it in your bra where you'll get cancer of the breasts. Um, known fact, don't use it to your head all the time. And if you do, only use it for a small period of time. So my, my coaching is if you're going to bring this technology to them, help them understand the potential dangers that may come with it. And if they're using a, a, a laptop or today's, today's laptop is, is a, uh, a tablet, have them shut off the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth if they're going to be keeping it anywhere close to them. Right. It solves the problem. It really does. Uh, it's a simple thing to do, and it does bring the protection you want for your children. Thank you. Thank you. So just a few last wrap up questions. First off, what personally brings you the greatest happiness or what I call the woohoo factor? <laughs> On your deathbed, you will try to think about the most important things in your life. And I can tell you most likely you won't think about the podcast you did. You won't think about the island you live on, what you'll think about is your friends and family. So what you should be celebrating is your friends and family around you because they're the most important thing in your life. Thank you. That is huge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So where can people go to find out more and to find your, I want to say beautiful book, but it's a, it's a little bit of a, of a gut twister, but it's beautifully important for everybody. Yeah, Mike, when, when I was writing it, I was really writing it for everyone to understand what was going on around them. There was no source, because this technology is fairly complicated sometimes. And so we needed something to do that, that Ma and the daughter and the father would understand. That's why we wrote the book. The best way to get to the book is actually go to our website um, at uh, DefenderShield.com. And DefenderShield.com, you'll find not just the book, but products as well, if you may be interested in that. But the book is where you go. And by the way, if you want to learn more about it, look at our, we have an extensive library of impacts to the body, for example. Uh, learning, uh, we have it in a learning section. So you really have a breakdown of all the sciences, the sources for all the sciences, so you can learn more about it uh, separate from the information you may find from our book. Thank you so much. So for everybody out there, that's DefenderShield.com. And if you didn't catch DefenderShield.com, come on over to InspireNationShow.com and we'll get you over to DefenderShield.com. Hey, you know, it's funny. We're, we got so frustrated with the medical community about electromagnetic hypersensitivity. I actually have a, um, a, a, a collection of um, medical community experts, researchers, clinic, clinicians, bioengineers, biochemists, and we're actually evaluating and creating tools that can be used by the clinician to identify the problem and how to fix it. We know how to do it. A, a blood, blood, blood brain barrier, for example. We, we know how to identify it and we know how to repair it. Um, I didn't talk about leaky gut. Weakened um, um, uh, immune system. Th th that could be the, the source of the challenge too, wh why it gets worse all the time. Oh, by the way, 80% of that 20%, 25% are women. Believe it or not, it's like, we don't know why, but most of the people are electro hypersensitive are female. It's wow. just amazing. It's amazing keep, statistics. I may keep that in right through here so people can hear that. Yeah, it's really, it's really, and, it, and, and we've tested it. We get a, many, many phone calls from those who suffer, and they ask, what can we do? I said, move the technology away from me, you'll be fine. You may be perfect, but all you got to do, take that laptop, move it a foot away from you, put it two foot away, and believe it or not, you may find it more tolerable. Most of the time, that's true, by the way. 
All they got to do is manage that stuff around them and they can really feel better. Um, I had one, I had one guy call me up and he said, I did everything you told me to do, but I still have a problem. So I asked him, did you go turn your Bluetooth off? No, I didn't do that. He turned it off and couldn't feel it anymore. That little Bluetooth signal that was coming out of the, the laptop was enough to disturb him. So you can manage it and you can help your wife. We got to get rid of the bees. I <laughs> the love bees. bees. <laughs> you, you, you will always remember bees in the room. And that's why I do it because it really does get you thinking, where are my bees? Where, where, where are the sources? What's the ultimate irony in that is I believe that part of the reason that bees may be challenged today in, in their whole mechanism of finding their ways around and bees disappearing um, is because of the oh, EMF yeah. that they're getting. Oh, there's no doubt. Yeah, there, and in fact, there's evidence, clear evidence of that uh, direct link. Um, I'm not sure we know the mechanics, but we do know that it's happening and, and, and it, it, it is real. So irony of all ironies. But what's important, people will remember, I won't die from one bee, I will buy from a thousand. And it's sort of a, it's a motivation to try to understand the environment they've created. Like, for example, you have a TV and you have um, a Roku, Apple, uh, a, a, a device that you've connected to the TV. You can go Wi-Fi or you can go Ethernet. Go to cable connected to it. Why go Wi-Fi? It doesn't need to be. Simple things like that actually help to improve your life. Thank you so much, Dan. Any last words of wisdom you want to share with people today? No, I, I, I think uh, they probably heard enough from me today. <laughs> <laughs> and probably want them to, to step away from the cell phone now and <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> shut off that Wi-Fi. Turn off that technology stuff. You don't need to be using it. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> it's, it's so ironic because I'm, I am so, I am so, technology is this world. Technology is allowing me to communicate with everybody. Yeah. But if we it's don't amazing. meter the use of our technology and look at how we can be smart with the technology, it'll also bite us in the butt. Oh, yeah, no question about it. And like smoking. When I was 12 years old, I smoked cigarettes because I wanted to be a big man. At that time, nothing in public domain about cancer-related connections. But do you know science knew at that time? So obviously I, I don't smoke, haven't smoked for 40 years, but you gotta be careful about the technologies that becomes part of our lives. Um, there's lots of really important and good things about that. At the same time, there may be some downsides and you got to be careful about that and you got to protect yourself you can't wait for someone else to protect you thank you so so much so for everyone out there this is michael sandler saying be well have fun get radiation nation and take small steps toward protecting your health today and shine bright Woohoo! <laughs> thank you so so much dan this is this is amazing and um it's, it's not the easiest topic, but what a huge public service you're doing. Thank you so much, buddy. Really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>